if you think of Deepwater Horizon, uh, it was a catastrophe, but if you had to have a catastrophe, you had it in the place which on the planet was best set up to respond. So you had deep water ports with ships, with robotic vehicles, all of which gave you an ability to respond to that event in very short order. What happens if we have an oil spill in the Arctic? You need to provide the first responders with, with something that's going to give them actionable information, uh, and yet it has to be something that they can do in the heat of the moment. They're trying to get as many people and as much equipment out there as quickly as possible, and we do that by building an autonomous underwater vehicle, so we take advantage of advances in robotics technology, uh, and in particular a vehicle which I developed under an earlier project which has very long endurance. LRAV, um, the Long Range Autonomous Underwater Vehicle known as Tethys, is one of the many vehicles that Jim Bellicam has helped to develop. It's a propeller-driven vehicle, like a Remus platform. It's a nice platform where you could add on to its basic under-the-hood science payload where you have a fluorometer, you, you measure water currents, temperature, salinity, and you're getting a good baseline of ocean data. But then you uh, need to be more specific about uh, what the special tasks of this vehicle are, and in this case, it's going underneath the ice and being able to uh, detect and potentially map out an oil spill. The idea is to make them quite simple to use and make that vehicle modular so you can develop different sensors, different abilities, behaviors, and have that nose that you can pull off and put on it depending on what the mission is. So this is the world's only propeller driven vehicle that has the battery payload, variable buoyancy, um, mass shifter capability where it can, on its own intelligence, decide how much power to use and depending on how long you want it to drive for. But we can stay under ice for 15 days or more, so whether you have an actual seat that you're trying to map out the source of a plume or you're trying to map out the entire water column within some box. Well, we're using the CL, it's a fluorometer based uh, system that measures a point source right at the vehicle. So right where the vehicle went, you get a nice measurement. But what would be nice is to have a standoff, to be able to look off into the distance and be able to see things. So we've added a multi-beam sonar, acoustic system that can look, look way off. And these two vehicles can work together where you've got one doing a, a big picture and the other one going to specific spots and measuring that as, as you go. So you don't want to waste your time swimming around with these other high energy, very specific sensors. That's another reason of working in tangent to why you might want to have multiple vehicles because you can't put everything on each vehicle because then you have trade-offs of loss of power and duration. If you're going to go deploy this vehicle in the Chechen Sea and there's oil there, the high resolution models you can get ahead what speed you should run at, what depths, what your duration would be. But we're also potentially can go into our autonomy mode. When the vehicle's off swimming a pre-programmed mission, it's listening or sniffing for some environmental anomaly. And so whatever we decide what that proxy is, the vehicle will trip and then go into an autonomy mission, which is a unique behavior that we decide it'll do. So it collects a specific amount of information in a really you know, sensitive area. And then once it does that, it can go back onto its pre-programmed mission. Uh, a new capability that we've got is uh, staying underwater. We frequently go to the surface to get a GPS fix. For the low power, we don't run the real high accuracy navigation. But what we do have now is the ability to acoustically go back to site, a known position, and reset our nav without going to the surface. And so what we've been able to do is test not only this underwater acoustic payload that's on board the vehicle, but newly developed hybrid Arctic buoys, where we've built three of them for this uh, project. And those because they allow the vehicle to stay underwater when you can't just pop up and use satellites. There's a hydrophone array, uh, it's newly integrated in Sailor UV, and that array can interrogate a transponder that's part of the system, and then home in on that and work on what we call dynamic docking. So the vehicle can acoustically home to these buoys, but they can also park itself onto these, these buoys and hang out there. So you can imagine if you're up in the high Arctic, maybe you want to save battery powder, we can home in onto a mooring on this buoy, a cable or a line, and actually dynamically attach itself to a wire where it can stay there and hang out in a low power mode, or maybe it does eventually run out of juice, but at least 
you're actually sitting there on the wire and you know you're parked there and you have a surface expression. Or maybe even the vehicle can just hang out there and someone at command control could be sending messages through Iridium to the buoy and then down to the vehicle acoustically and the vehicle can then undock itself. But you can imagine that the theater that could be in play with multiple vehicles. So easy access to this vehicle to deploy it really quickly and up out front to characterize the entire environment to get a head start on what's happening. So then you can deploy other systems, multiple vehicles, because you can't accomplish the big picture of totally surveying a system and understanding what's happening with one platform. You need to inform others. And so the real sweet spot of LRUV is the ability to stay out for a long period of time. Three mission for other assets might even be able to arrive on scene. In September, deployed in Santa Barbara, we had LRUV with its oil sensing payload doing the broad scale missions and surveys. And then we added other vehicles that had more specific sensors, like the ability to take a water sample in a gulf. Also, a holographic camera that could take three-dimensional images. And so it was, it was feeding us out on the Coast Guard cutter heat maps of where these hot spots were. And so the CL did a fantastic job of finding these anomalies in the water column at depth. And then we were able to inform other vehicles that were deployed to be able to go right to those areas and avoid at least a valuable time on the sensitive ship with all these people on board. We sent it out uh, on a pre-programmed uh, mission from shore, ran the survey, we got a basic sense of the environment, and we started a new mission that did um, source localization. So it kind of swam back until it picked up uh, the signature in the water column. It could detect the edges of that, and it made onboard decisions to stay inside that patch. And while that had started, the ship went out and deployed one of these moorings. With the one mooring, we could now send data back from the vehicle underwater, just like it were under ice. That message went to the gateway acoustically and then over satellite or cell phone back to shore to the operators. One of the next steps in this project would be to work on alternative energy solutions for the vehicle and harvesting energy from the ocean, from underneath the ice, and doing some uh, recharge capability on the vehicle. We're also looking into putting different sonars and cameras on the, on the vehicle. So we have to decide um, what are the level priorities of importance. So what's possible is putting a bathymetry multi-beam sonar so you can make three-dimensional nautical charts. And you can have uh, obstacle avoidance acoustics and that sonar can also potentially see oil droplets, um, gas droplets in the water column in the Arctic. And you can also put sound devices and hydrophone listening devices on vehicles and you can listen for whales and know where the high populations of whales are coming through when they're under ice. And then we also have a variety of other physical and biological sensors that many scientists can benefit from in helping create and improve models in areas of high resolution. So that's whether it's temperature, water currents, dissolved oxygen, bioproductivity, you know, fluorescence turbidity, backscatter, which are a lot of the same fluorescent sensors we use to detect oil dissolved hydrocarbons in the water. And so we have to really go through all the strengths and the weaknesses of the system and do a full evaluation of that and then come up with what is we're going to tackle into year seven of this program. And it's maybe even looking at making LREV a deeper rated vehicle. Right now it's rated at 300 meters. We, I think we need to look over the Arctic horizon and deeper water and more, you know, longer range and think about some of the other research questions beyond an oil spill that, that DHS can benefit from. These are very interesting times, and uh, I think there are times when, when uh, you know, we're behind uh, in terms of our understanding of this incredible, spectacular, but rapidly changing environment up there. And for me, that's a, a good chunk of the excitement of this project, is starting to provide people who care about that and work in that environment the tools that will let them really really get a snapshot and be able to respond in the right way, in the sensible way, when things happen or even when just policy decisions have to be made.